debate, and both sides of this debate agree that women have been discriminated against through history. But that discrimination and that sexism isn't just about active, everyday sexism. It's about sexism who have been created through the state apparatus, but it's also about latent structures who have harmed many, many women and will continue to do so until it is very clear what those problems are and until there is political capital to change. We'll talk about two things in summarizing this debate. First, I want to look at the way that this can symbolically make people aware of the oppression women face and why that's beneficial. And secondly, I will look at why money itself is helpful for women, why money can break many of those structures, and why we think that is hugely beneficial. Firstly, several points of response to the previous speech. One, on the pay gap. The previous speaker says, surely we should take other measures to solve the pay gap. We've been trying since the 1960s. None of them have been enough. What's more importantly, and more important, she says, is that you don't want to give them excuses not to do anything more about giving employees excuses not to employ people. That may well be true, but ultimately this creates the political capital to change. Because in the previous moments, all men don't have to pay as a result of the oppression for women. Under this model, men realize, uh, men realize that they have to pay for the oppression of women, and this creates a capital of change. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Secondly, she said, in response to our extension, that we're trapping women as pet caregivers. Absolutely not get, uh, wrong, and she missed the point Jack was making. He said, firstly, some women will always choose to be caregivers, and we think it is harmful for them when they don't get anything out of it. But more importantly, this is what allows women to break out of those roles in the first place, because currently they are trapped by their husbands, they are trapped by the men in their lives, because those are the people with financial powers. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Finally, she says, you can't have a movement all of women, because you don't have a common identity amongst women. In the first place, the point we are making is it can help create that common identity amongst women. Women may know they're women, but they don't necessarily realize that they are all victims of oppression, irrespective of what, uh, what, what level in society they are in. We think this is a huge way of helping deal with that. This is why you can create those perceptions and those changes. She gives you two points. So she, she, first, she says, it's abhorrent to use money, i.e. capitalism oppresses women. Response one, they're not getting rid of capitalism, right? Capitalism will always exist to oppress women. The question is, what can you do best to work within it? At which point, all of Jack's materials are relevant, none of which got an answer to. The second point we're going to make on this is when they look at issues about dowries, when they look at issues of prostitution. Those were all cases where there's a commodification of women. And in those cases, women had to give something to men. With dowries, there was a condition for them to get married. This is good, this is an explicit apology for all of those problems which exist. The second thing she claims is this harms women deceptually. She says, firstly, this is because it shows women to be distinct categories from other individuals within the state. It doesn't do that. It shows women's oppression to be a distinct category from the oppression of men within the state. And because the oppression of women was often very different than the oppression of men, even though some other sexism existed, uh, exactly as so this proposition showed, showed you, we're more than happy with that. But secondly, they say, this is the issue that the job is done. No, it's not yet again with the political capital issues, yet again because she's trying to the movement overall. But the final argument, she says, perceptually this is hugely harm, harmful because it makes it seem like women are taking things. No, it isn't, because there's a key difference. One of the major problems of the feminist movement is many individuals see this as women kicking up a fuss. What this policy does is say women have been oppressed and deserve it as a result. That changes the very discourse practices around it. So first, let's talk about the, symbolic, uh, the symbolism of this. In the first place, we think it's important to break lots of the perceptions which exist right now, which is that feminist movement has already succeeded when you use a few role models to say feminism has succeeded. But the important issue to realize is the oppression of women still exists within society. It is often, however, far more, it's far more mystified than the other kinds of oppression. It's, about, it's not about issues about voting rights, it's not about issues about women not getting jobs. It is often instead about the expectations of women themselves and what, uh, and what women expect themselves to do and the positions men put them in. It's about issues like the Easy Bake Oven and, that, uh, and Barbie dolls, which are actually social symbols which institutionalize women into particular roles. These are problems which do exist for all women and press them, but they often do not realize. What is hugely advantageous about this policy? Because it says that which you may consider natural is in fact oppression. That which has previously been mystified as the role you should have within society is something which is harming you. And the moment you can realize that is the moment you can take action against it. That's the moment you can real political change. That's the moment women are more aware of it, but also when men are aware, even if they don't want to be sexist, that the policies and kinds of ideas and attitudes they put in place are themselves ultimately perpetuating the systems of sexism and the harm to women. But the second issue is why the financial shift itself is ultimately valuable to women. 
even if you accept everything the opposition tells you, they have never given you a comparative for why it is worse for women when you get this money and the things which can happen as a result of those money. Jack gives you several advantages. The first of these is allowing more and more women to be educated. One of the major reasons people don't participate in education, tertiary or otherwise, is because they do not have the funds to do so. So the media term, having said, goes to work. We think this allows women to have money, uh, have money left over to, uh, to ultimately seek education. We think it's beneficial for them to get more and more of those, uh, of those uh, good positions overall and become more of their own models. Go ahead. Your case assumes an exponential amount of goodwill for women. Do you think that exists? Okay, well firstly, it doesn't just assume that, it assumes there'll be some more goodwill for women, and more importantly, exactly the point of proving now, on a practical level, giving them more money liberates them. On the second point of this, is ultimately creates balance within the homes. One of the major issues women face right now is they are collapsed overall. They, for instance, don't, often when they don't have jobs, they are trapped by the men in their lives who have the money. That might be their fathers, that might well be their husbands. What this is beneficial in doing is allow women to break away from those structures and to say that we ultimately uh, that, that, and not be so financially dependent on men. You can leave the home if you don't like your father. That Islamic woman is now far more able to break away from the demands of her husband, demands of her father, because she can live without, uh, because she can live without them. And, and further to that, it creates perceptional changes in these situations that shows that they are contributing in the home and makes it much better in those cases. But finally, it allows for political change itself. Ultimately, one of the major issues when it comes to female campaigning is both the invisibility of the issues which females have to campaign about, but ultimately, the lack of funds that women have to pursue particular political movements. The idea is that when you don't have lots of women with lots of money, and the ones who do have a lot of money ultimately don't feel that they're part of the feminist movement because they don't ultimately feel their oppression is the same, they don't contribute to political movements at all. So you never really get the same kind of political action, particularly the invisible movements when it comes to, when it comes to issues for women, as you ever did in terms of men or other kinds of minorities. This gives them that power. This means that more and more political actors will ultimately look towards women if they are a valuable constituency when it comes to getting money and raising it for campaigns. We think that helps. On a financial level, this is hugely beneficial for women. It breaks the structures of oppression, both practically because of the value of money in these situations, but also makes people aware of the crisis and change perceptions. We're very happy to propose.